can't run over too much. All right, should we go ahead and get started? All right. Okay, so today we're very fortunate to have Swar Ravindranath um, as our speaker, uh, giving a demonstration of the new Pandeya JWST Exposure Time Calculator. Um, I'd like to note that um, Swara is the lead for the Exposure Time Calculator Working Group here at um, Space Telescope. Um, and this is a, um, a multi-instrument working group um, that uh, Swara oversees and coordinates its efforts. Um, so, uh, Swara. Okay. So, welcome to everybody in the room and welcome to those online. Uh, in this talk, what I want to do is provide an overview of the graphical user interface of the JWST Exposure Time Calculator Pandeya. Uh, I'll start with a short presentation and then go on to uh, show you some examples that actually illustrate uh, the key concepts of the ETC user interface that you can use uh, very efficiently while doing the ETC calculations for your JWST proposals. Now, before I start, I want to uh, give you the information about some links and resources that would be useful. Now, the first link there is the link to the ETC tool itself. The ETC was released to the astronomy community in January, um, just about a month ago. And along with the tool, the documentation was also released. Uh, there are about 14 articles of uh, ETC documentation on JDOC's website, which gives you the details of uh, the graphical uh, user interface and how you can use it for your ETC calculations. For more technical discussions about the ETC algorithm and how the ETC engine uh, works, there is the SPIE proceedings paper led by Klaus von Tappeden, uh, which describes the ETC algorithms. Um, so that's a key reference if you want to know the actual, uh, how the code is implemented. And there was also a community lecture given by Klaus von Tappeden last month, um, which again describes the algorithms and I would strongly recommend that if you want to know how the different uh, features are implemented. So the JWST ETC, uh, it uses a very modern concept in the sense that uh, the flux distribution from an astronomical scene, including the source and the background, are modeled in a full three-dimensional cube along the two spatial axes and along the wavelength axis. And then you consider the projections in the spatial axis or the wavelength axis uh, to use it for the ETC calculations, um, depending on the observing mode for imaging or spectroscopy. The key aspect also is that it's a pixel-based ETC, which means that you can actually uh, model the characteristics of the detector much better, particularly things like correlated noise. And an additional advantage of that method is also that you can apply data analysis steps and post-processing steps to the data just the way you would um, do with your obs observed data and then compute the signal to noise. And because you can model very complex astronomical scenes, which include multiple sources, this also gives you a better way to est um, estimate the contamination. For example, when you have overlapping sources, particularly when you have, say, for example, a faint source sitting on a bright background or something. So it helps you estimate the contamination much better. And also the ETC um, supports all the advanced JWST observing modes, uh, imaging the different kinds of spectroscopy, with uh, fixed slit spectroscopy, slit -lit spectroscopy, IFU, multi-object spectroscopy, and advanced uh, you know, coronography, aperture masking interferometry, and all of these advanced modes. Now, coming to the JWST user interface, it is a modern web application which allows you to use different workflows to do the ETC calculation. So there is no one strict procedure that you have to follow in order to do your ETC calculation. You can approach it from different ways and do it in a way that's more comfortable for you. So you can establish your own workflow of how you want to do the ETC calculation. It also has interactive plotting tools and such that will allow you to compare multiple sets of calculations. So you really don't have to kind of write down everything on a piece of paper or you know keep your own notes, but it's all there. and you can have interactive plots that let you compare the results of different calculations. The ETC calculations are organized in what is called workbooks. And workbooks are, uh, can be 
They can be used to organize all the calculations that relate to a particular theme, and it is also easy to share it with your collaborators, so it enables active collaboration. So let me go into some of the key uh, features of the ETC uh, user interface. Like I mentioned, all of your ETC calculations are organized in what is called a workbook. And the workbook can contain multiple sources in a source library. It can have multiple scenes in a scene library. And you can use these multiple sources and scenes in different calculations. And you can have multiple calculations using different instruments and different modes. So you can organize the entire thing either by a theme or by your project. And the workbooks are persistent uh, as long as you're using your MyST account, meaning to say that every time you log in, your workbooks will be there, and then you can share them with your collaborators. Another uh, feature that I would like to highlight is the reusability of scenes and sources. What the ETC calls a scene is a small post stamp of the sky, which is few arc seconds on a side. And a scene can have a single source, it can have no source at all, in which case it's just a background, or it can be composed of multiple sources. And the sources and scenes, once defined, they're there so you can use them in multiple calculations. The kind of workflow that we recommend for the ETC UI is a copy and modify workflow, which means that you don't really have to start all your calculations from scratch every time. Instead, you can actually copy an existing calculation and then modify it. And every calculation um, for every mode and every instrument in the ETC starts with a default calculation, which has a default scene with a default source, which has some reasonable input parameters. So the users can simply copy that calculation and then modify the inputs as desired and recalculate. Another feature I want to bring to your attention is the auto update feature. What this essentially means is that when you make a change in any of your source properties that is already used in a scene, every calculation, it, it, the changes that you make in the scene propagate into all the calculations. So all of your calculations will get auto-updated. Now, the way I like to think about it is when you have changed the property of the source, then that source with the previous property does not exist anymore. So a calculation carrying that source will not exist. So this is something that you have to keep in mind. And of course, you can upload your own spectrum. For example, if you don't find your favorite spectrum in the templates that we have provided, you can upload your own spectrum. And the file format is a two-column ASCII file with a wavelength uh, as the first column and your flux density as a second column. And you can also upload FITS files with wavelength and uh, a two-column file with wavelength as a first uh, column and flux as a second column. You can see the details in the documentation as to what units you can specify for the flux and so on. One thing you would want to check is that make sure that your input files are compatible with Python 4. If you are not able to use it in Python 4, then it will not be compatible with the ETC. And how to check that is also uh, information that's provided in the documentation. One very useful feature is the batch expansion feature. So for example, if you have a calculation uh, where you have set all the parameters, like the background, the detector setup, um, and you've selected a particular scene, now you just want to see how things vary just by filter, then there is a way you can actually expand by filter, and it will do the calculation over all the filters by varying only the filter as a parameter. And you can do the same thing also with expansion over time parameters, because you can change the exposure time uh, in these detectors either by changing the number of groups or by changing the number of integrations. Um, so those are two ways in which you can achieve a change in the exposure time. And you can expand over these parameters to see how the SNR changes or the signal noise changes with, as a function of time. The last point, uh, we encourage uh, collaborative work. So workbook sharing is enabled, and it's strongly encouraged. And it's easy to do. All you have to do is just select a workbook from your available workbook list page. And you can assign user access per, uh, permissions to your collaborator. And the shared, once you put in the email of the collaborator and add, uh, you know, give the access permission and share it with the collaborator, they will see it on their workbook list, available workbook list, when they log in using their MyST account. 
Now, while you're using the ETC in a collaborative fashion, we um, advise you to coordinate with your collaborators so that you don't modify the files uh, at the same time and start clobbering the files uh, that you're working on. So for a first time user who logs into the ETC, this is the um, this, uh, this is the first page that you see. And here you have the option to either start working on this by creating a new workbook or by getting a copy of the sample workbook. For a first time user, we advise you to use a sample workbook because it will help you um, do the copy and modify workflow. Now here's a case where I have uh, selected some, I've copied some of the sample workbooks that gives you an idea of the kind of workbooks we uh, have uh, provided as samples. And if you select one of the workbooks, you can actually see that your access permissions are shown there. And is there a way I can point to things here? Um, uh, with your cursor. Okay. All right, there you go. Uh, they're, they're having a little bit of trouble with the sound online, so if maybe you could speak up a little bit. Okay. A little louder. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you highlight uh, a selected available workbook, it actually shows you down here the user access permissions. So if you want to share one of the workbooks after you have worked on it with your collaborator, what you would do is provide the email of your collaborator here and then add the user by email. And their name will appear here. You can provide them with whatever permission you think is appropriate, the read, write, grant, or revoke permissions. Now I also want to draw your attention up here to the help menu. Now when you go to the help menu, um, All right, so when you go to the help menu, there are a uh, few items listed here. There is a user guide which, take a link, which is linked to the JWST official uh, ETC documentation. And then there is a known issues link which will provide you with documentation on some of the known issues which affect the accuracy, the workflow, usability, and also tells you about some of the warnings. And we also have there some workarounds which will let you deal with the issues. So anytime when you encounter a problem while running the ETC calculation, we suggest that you first go and check whether it is a known issue because you may find workarounds to deal with that issue there. And the release notes give you the highlight of the current release and the previous versions. And then there is the link to the help desk, which will take you to the JWST help desk where you can post uh, the questions uh, related to your ETC calculations if you run into problems. And it also gives you the access to a knowledge base that we are creating based on frequently asked questions. So when you load uh, one of the available workbooks by clicking on the load button, the first thing that you get to is the calculations page. Now the calculations page has a summary of all the calculations in the calculation table here, and then on right next to it is the configuration pane. Now configuration pane is where you give, pr provide all the inputs that you're going to use in the calculation, like selecting which scene you want to use, uh, what background you would uh, prefer to use, the instrument setup, the detector setup, and also the strategy tab. Now the strategy tab is where you set the location from where you want to uh, extract the flux <laughs> for your signal to noise calculation. This is also where you uh, decide what should be the size of the aperture from which you're extracting the flux and also setting all the background parameters. The lower panels here show you the uh, outputs of the ETC calculation. This is an imaging calculation. So you have your 2D image, uh, and then there's the plots here. Um, the plots are controlled by checking the boxes here. So in this case, you know the checkbox is for the nearest imaging calculation here. So it shows you the signal to noise for that particular imaging calculation. And then there is a report pane which gives you the uh, scalar quantities that are calculated by the ETC. Now the same thing for a spectroscopy example. Uh, so you can see that the two-dimensional spectra is displayed here and you have the signal to noise as a function of wavelength. Um, now I want to draw your attention here to the fact that the scene is reusable. So you can see that the scene that is used is listed here and it's the same scene that is being used for multiple instruments, multiple modes. Uh, so that tells you about the reusability of the scene. I also want to draw your attention to this particular column here, which uh, tells you the status of the ETC calculation. So when you see a green uh, symbol with a um, 
tick mark in it, that means that the calculation ran without any problem. Um, when you have an orange symbol with an exclamation sign, it actually tells you that there, there is some information that you need to know and you will want to check the warnings on the report page. And a red X, uh, that symbol tells you that the ETC could not complete the calculation because of some reason, and in which case you want to go and see under the errors. Now, all of these tabs will be highlighted. If there is a warning, the warning tab will be highlighted. If, if there is an error, the error tab will be highlighted. So I'm actually going to um, skip this particular slide because this is only um, intended in case uh, people download the slides and you know they just want a quick reference, but I've already gone through this. And we will go through this again when we do the demos. So I'm going to skip over this. On the reports page, uh, there are some things I want to highlight. Like I mentioned, the report gives you all of the scalar quantities that the ETC has calculated. For example, the extracted flux in, a, in the aperture, the variance, the, um, you know, the sky background that it calculates in the extraction aperture, and how much of that is coming from contamination from within the scene itself. This could be from overlapping objects in the case of multiple sources. And the warnings, Warnings give you information that might affect the accuracy, so you may want to know about this in order to make science decisions, whether you want to go on with this calculation or do you want to change something. Errors tell you why the calculation could not even complete, so this is more serious, which means your input parameters are in some way not correct or not compatible or not allowed in some cases. Um, and then. There is, a, um, th there is a download tab here, which allows you to actually download a tar file of some of the intermediate and output products. Uh, so some of the things that are there in the tar file are the FITS file of the 3D data cube for the uh, IFU um, calculations. You also have the 2D images and spectra, and then you also get in, fit in FITS format, and you also have the extracted flux, the combined backgrounds, and the signal to noise ratio all provided as FITS tables. Now, this can be downloaded and then you can use it with your own tools and you know your own favorite um, way you want to analyze the images. So apart from the calculations page, which we've been focusing all this time, the other uh, page here that you would be constantly interacting with would be the scenes and sources page. Now this has the scene library. That is all the scenes that you have created, it has all the sources that you have created, and this is also the page where you have a source editor where you can change the properties of the source. Now I also want to highlight on this page how the different things are interlinked. So when you choose a scene, the scene that is chosen is highlighted in yellow, and in green it highlights all of the sources that are present in that scene. And also down here, it highlights all of the calculations on your calculation page that use that particular scene. So the thing to remember is when you make a change in a source, in any of these sources that are highlighted in green, that means you have changed the scene in some way, and that means it's going to affect all of these calculations that use that particular scene. And in this case, for example, there are nine calculations. So when you make a change in one of the sources here, you're actually auto-updating all of the nine calculations here. And also, when you highlight on the source, it will highlight the scene that contains that source and also all the calculations that use the source, uh, that particular scene. There is a scene sketch here, which provides you a sketch of the uh, highlighted or the selected scene. And the source that is selected will be highlighted in the scene. Here is a plot of all the source spectrum. Now, you can either plot one source spectrum at a time, you can plot multiple spectra by clicking on the checkboxes here. Now, one example where you could use this would be, say, for example, you have created two sources, uh, exactly the same source, but in one case, you uh, applied a different extinction, and you want to see, uh, you want to compare the two plots before they're actually used in the ETC calculation. So that's where this can be useful. Uh, so this is, again, just a summary of the uh, scenes and sources page, and I have some uh, tips here that may be useful when you're looking at this for reference later. And like I said, this is the page that also contains the source editor where you can change the source properties, uh, the continuum, the redshift, extinction, normalization, you can add spectral lines uh, to the spectrum and also change the shape. And also, this is where you can actually decide 
the offsets where you want to place the source and also provide it with um, an orientation, a uh, position angle. So with that brief overview, I just want to go into the JWST uh, ETC demos. Now here are some of the things that I want to highlight in the demos. First is a copy and modify workflow. The second thing I want to show is a calculation that uses an upload, uploaded spectrum. Uh, also show you how the batch expansion works. Also want to um, show you some of the errors and warnings that you would see, uh, particularly relating to saturation and so on. And if I have the time, I may show you how to create some complex sources. So. I'm having trouble finding the mouse. Okay, not the mouse, sorry, the cursor. Uh, so I'm going to log in with my MySD account. Okay, in this case, uh, it seems to remember <laughs> my login, so I'm just going to proceed here. Um, so, like I said, because I've logged in with my MySD account, you can already see all of the workbooks. Uh, they're persistent, they're there. Um, but for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to use create a new workbook. And I'm going to load the new workbook. Now, when you load the workbook, like I said, I mean, you end up on the calculations page and you see all the JWST instruments are listed here. Each of them is a drop down menu which tells you what are the observing modes available with these different instruments. I'm going to start off with a near cam short wavelength uh, calculation. So you can see that the moment you select an instrument and the mode, there is a calculation that's triggered off immediately and this uses the default scene that contains the default point source. So the first thing I want to show you is a copy and uh, modify workflow. Now, before I go to that, let me just show you. So you cannot see the results here yet of that calculation. So you actually have to highlight or select that calculation in order to see the ETC outputs. So there are your 2D images showing the 2D SNR and uh, the detector count rate. In this case, there is no saturation. So your saturation map doesn't show you anything. And then you have the plot window. Now the plots are controlled by the checkboxes here. So that's checked and you have the aperture flux. Uh, you have the, uh, from, that's from the source. And then you have the aperture um, extracted sky background. You have the signal to noise that's in the extracted aperture as a function of wavelength, also as a function of time. And the last tab here is a contrast. Now contrast is activated only for coronography because that's a mode where you're interested to see uh, with what contrast you can detect a faint source or a faint feature uh, next to a bright target. So to demonstrate the copy and modify workflow, I'm actually going to copy this calculation. You go up here on your edit menu, you copy the calculation. That's going to create an exact duplicate version of that calculation. Now I'm going to select that and then modify, say, and change to a different filter. Let me choose a different filter. That doesn't do anything. You click calculate and then it initiates the calculation. So now I have two calculations here and I can actually compare them by if I check the plot tab here, the checkbox under the top plot tab, you can see both of the values that are plotted here. And you can compare the aperture flux. You can compare what the background was in those two cases and signal to noise. Now, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to modify one of the source properties. So there is a scene tab here, which will actually allow you to tweak the parameters of the source here. But one thing to be careful about as you proceed with doing more and more calculations is anytime you change anything here, that is also going to change the properties of that source in the source library. So that is something that one has to be careful about. Um, so let me just change that to 
Now, when I click the calculate button, you can see that it has triggered off both of those calculations. And that is because I've changed the property of the source, which is in scene one, and both of these calculations use scene one. So they're instantly, it, it triggers calculation of both. So now, let me just go to the scenes <clears throat> and sources. And let's see how we can create a new source. So following the copy and modify workflow, you could just simply copy the source. That would create a new source, which you can then go ahead and modify. So I'm just going to modify that. I'm going to call it source2. And I'm going to choose a different continuum for that. I'm going to use a stellar spectrum. And I'm going to renormalize that to microgens. And I hit the save button. And now I can actually see my source spectrum here. Okay. So you can add lines to source, which I'm not going to do now. Shape, it's a point source, that's fine. The last tab here is the offset. Now, you can see that the offset refers to the position of the source in the scene. And I have not yet allocated the source to any scene. So there is no reference with which to offset it. So the first thing you need to do then is to actually add the source into the scene. For now, I'm going to add it to the scene. So I highlight the scene. The source that I want to add is highlighted. And I add the source. So now that you have the source added, you can actually see that it appears in the scene sketch. Now, in this case, we, we did a copy and modify for the source. Now, you can also create a new source by clicking on the new uh, button here. So I'm going to use that. And Use that to show you an example for an extended source. So go to the continuum. I'm going to choose one of the extragalactic templates from the Brown et al. atlas. I'm going to choose a different galaxy. And I could choose to redshift it. I'm going to give it, place it at a redshift of two. Um, and maybe give it a point to a magnitude extinction. And I'm going to go to the renormalize button. In this case, I prefer to normalize it in a band pass. So I'm going to change that to a galaxy that has a 24 AB magnitude in the near cam short wavelength F200 W filter. I'm going to save that. Now you can see the source spectrum here. So this is a redshifted spectrum. Uh, it's redshifted and then the normalization has been applied. I'm going to leave the lines for now. Uh, it's already a spectrum that has emission lines in it. I'm going to change the shape of this. Uh, so this is an extended source. I'll choose the CERSIC profile for that. And I can change the size of the object here by changing the semi-major and semi minor axes, and I'm going to leave it at a specific index of 1, and I say. And again, to use the offset tab, um, I need to place this in a scene. So what I'm going to do is I've selected the galaxy already, put it in that scene, so I'm just going to add the source. Now. As you can see, right now I've not provided the offset for anything, so all of them are sitting right on top of each other. So let me just move the galaxy, and I'm also going to give it a position angle. Let's say. And you have now two sources. My source two is actually sitting on top of the default source one. So let me just move that one as well. So. Say. Now, the thing to remember is because I've made all of those changes <clears throat> in my scene one, and that was my default scene, you can see that the, every time I make a change there, all of the calculations are getting updated.
So now what I want to show you is how you can create a new scene from existing sources. So I'm going to click New under the Scene tab. <clears throat> I'm going to select that scene. I'm going to select the galaxy from my existing source library. And I'm just going to add the source here. I'm also going to take the source from here, my source 2, and add that to the same scene. And maybe, in this case, I'm interested in maybe an unresolved clump that is um, sitting somewhere in the disk of a galaxy. So I'm going to just move it to and save that. Now, there may be cases where uh, you want to kind of simulate a situation where you have an unresolved clump that is sitting maybe at the edge of the galaxy and also closer to the galaxy. It has all the same properties, but you want to see how placing it in a different background is going to affect your signal to noise, in which case you can just go ahead and copy that source. I'm just going to copy the source. I'm going to give it a different name. I'm going to call it source 4. And I'm just going to add the source here. And now that it is in the scene, I can go ahead and offset it. <clears throat> in which case, I'm just going to give it a small Y offset. Um, so now you have your two sources. And then you can use this new scene now in any calculation that you like. I'm going to do a quick nearest imaging calculation. change the filter to F90, let's say, and I calculate. And you should be able to see the source here. Okay, I forgot to change the scene. That's what happened. I'm sorry about that. I was trying to show you how to use a new scene in the calculation, and I kept calculating with the same, <laughs> same scene. Sorry about that. So you can see when you choose your scene too, it actually shows you all of the new sources that you have created in your new scene. So I'm just going to go back to that nearest calculation. Um, So now you can see the result from your new uh, calculation where you had those two unresolved clumps located in different parts of the disk. So the next thing I want to do is show you a... So the, in, the, in the next part of the demo, I actually want to show you how to use an upload, uh, uploaded user-supplied spectrum. So you go to the Upload Spectra tab here, and in this case, I'm just going to use a test uh, Stellar Spectrum, a fixed file. Open that, and click on Upload. And you have a pop-up box that says that you've successfully uploaded the spectrum. You say OK. Go to your Scenes and Sources. Now I'm going to create a new source here. I'm going to call it a test star so that I know I can keep track of that source. Uh, I'm going to give it a continuum. So, in, so you go upload to your uploaded file. You can see that the spectrum that I've uploaded is already there. If you have a number of different spectra that you have uploaded, they're all going to show up in the menu. So you can select from there. 
I'm going to apply a renormalization. Uh, let's say I choose to make that something like 5.5 microdensity source in the NeoCam short wavelength 200 filter. And I'm just going to save that source. So you can see the source spectrum, the uploaded source spectrum here. And I'm going to create a new scene so that I, I don't recalculate everything else that I've done before. I'm going to add that source here. Okay. Now I go to the calculations page and I'm going to run a near cam imaging. I want to use my new scene that I've created. So I'm going to go to the scene page. I'm going to choose scene three, which contains the test star. Now, I want to use this opportunity also to show, tell you something about the backgrounds. So when you specify the backgrounds, you can actually give the position on the sky. I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to enter the coordinates of the source here. So once you enter the position of the object, you can either choose to uh, use a dateless background or a dated background. So when you use a dated background, um, the ETC will use the background model generator to um, calculate what is a model sky valley, I mean the sky background at that uh, position and at that, on that particular date. On the other hand, if you choose a dateless background, then you have the option of choosing low, medium, or high, and they refer to the 10th percentile, the 50th percentile, and 90th percentile of the sky background values um, over the period of visibility at that particular position. So in this case, I'm going to choose a dated background. So let's say I choose and you may also want to make sure, you want to look at the visibility tool and make sure that on this particular date, this, these particular coordinates are available. If not, it will give you an error message that says that this particular part of the sky is not available during that time. I'm going to go to the instrument setup and let me choose a different filter. I'm going to choose a different readout this time. Uh, and if you want more details about the readout patterns that are available for the different detectors, you may want to consult the documentation on the different uh, instrument pages. Hence, I'm going to keep my aperture location centered on the source and to run this calculation. Sometimes ETC calculations are slow, so you have to be patient. <laughs> so the more complex modes that you go into, I mean, in this case, it's a simple imaging calculation, but uh, when it's a more complex mode, then you know you usually have to uh, be a little patient. Uh, so, so this shows how you can actually upload a spectra, uh, I mean, uh, upload your own user-supplied spectra and then use it for a calculation. Now, I'm also going to use it for a near-spec fixed slit calculation. Now you can see that every time I choose a mode for any instrument, it's always using the default uh, calculation. So this is also one of the reasons why you don't want to mess up too much with your default calculation, because if you made a mistake uh, while modifying the default scene, then that's the one that's going to be used for every default calculation when you select a mode. So this is why it's strongly recommended that you always do a copy and modify so that you keep that default calculation there. Uh, so I'm going to actually choose this user 
supplied spectra source here. And I'm going to use the same background. I could just use a little background. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to use the, okay, for the instrument setup, I'm going to change this to, I'm going to select one of the prisms here. Now you notice instantly it gives you uh, a warning saying that it tells you that the wavelength in the aperture spectral extraction strategy is at a different range. That is because the default value there does not correspond to the change that you made now. So that's just to indicate to you that you have to be sure that you go there and make that change. So I'm going to come here and change this to a valid a wavelength range. Now, when you do a spectroscopy calculation, this uh, wavelength of interest is important because all of the scalar values that are reported here are going to correspond to that wavelength of interest. Um, so I'm also, and now because this is a spectroscopy observation, I'm actually going to increase the exposure time a little bit. Let's say uh, I change the number of groups, I can change the number of integrations. Now, the moment you change the time here, you can actually see that this is about an hour of observation. So when you adjust these parameters, and if you enter, you can actually see the corresponding exposure time. So I'll calculate that. So this is the time you sip your cup of coffee. <laughs> All right, there you go. So there's your uh, near spec uh, calculation. It uses your user supplied spectra and, and you're happy. So with that, I wanna go to the next theme. And because my next theme that I wanna show you is a batch expansion and a, a batch expansion will create a lot of calculations. I don't wanna keep overdoing on the same workbook. So I'm going to open a new workbook to show you this. So let me load that workbook. I'm not gonna do anything fancy with the sources here. I'm just going to start a simple near spec fixlet observation. And all I'm going to do is just change the detectors. I mean, I, I just want to show you how you can expand over uh, exposure time parameters. So like I said, you can change the exposure time either by changing the number of groups or by changing the number of integrations. In this case, I'm going to expand groups. I'm going to start with 10 groups and I'm going to use a step size of two and I'm going to do five iterations and now I click submit. Now all of these calculations are for the default scene, the default source with all the same input parameters here. The only thing that's changing is the end groups. So as I, I mean, on this, if I leave this tab open here and I walk through these, you can see how the number of groups is changing. So it's a step of two that you're requesting. Now, once you have done the batch expansion, you can then go under plot, say plot all, and it will show you the spectra that it has, uh, the signal to noise as a function of wavelength for all of these calculations. Now, because I have multiple plots here, I also want to show you a feature of this uh, interactive uh, plot tool. Particular, okay, so for one thing, you can actually download the plot uh, and you, know, you can keep this for your record or use it anywhere in your a proposal if you want. Um, and there is also the option to zoom. You can actually, oops. You can zoom on any part of the plot. Uh, there is also the pan option. So hover around, uh, go back and reset the axis. One thing I want to show you, which is particularly important, is this particular thing where you can compare the data on hover. And this is very useful because for a given x value, it will show you the y values corresponding to that point. So you can actually read off the values right away. And it also shows you which calculation that corresponds to, particularly when you've done a batch mode and expanded over so many calculations, this becomes a very useful way to go back and see which calculation you're referring to and to compare. Now, when you've done a batch expansion, one 
very cool thing that you can do is actually look at the signal to noise ratio as a function of time because this is the parameter that you changed right you were looking at the behavior as a function of time and the thing is you can actually also use this plot to read off what is the exposure time you would need in order to get a particular signal to noise ratio now in order to show you another interesting thing about uh, the way your signal to noise behaves with exposure time, I'm also going to show you an expansion over integration. So it's the same calculation we started out for the n groups, but this time we're going to actually do an expansion over integrations. I'm just going to keep these as the default values because you know that's okay just for uh, demonstrating. Uh, so there is the start value of one integration. It's going to step through uh, a step size of one and do five iterations. So I'm just going to submit that calculation. And if I go under the plot and I say plot all of them, you can now actually see <clears throat> the difference in the behavior when you try to change your exposure time using n groups or uh, integration. So all of these calculations correspond to the change as you change the n groups, and these correspond to what you get when you change the integrations. So now I'm just going to uncheck all of that because I want to run a new calculation. Uh, in this case, I'm going to choose a nearest imaging calculation because what I want to show is <clears throat> how you can do an expansion over filters. So I'm going to select that calculation, go under expand, and say expand filters. Nearest has 12 imaging filters. So not right now, for the same scene and all the other same parameters, it's just changing the filters. And I'm just going to plot all of these. So unfortunately, now I have too many calculations. I also have spectroscopy calculations, which is why I have to go click, uh, click them one by one. And here is the signal to noise as a function of wavelength in the different filters. Now, if you're not interested in seeing the medium band filters, for example, uh, what you can do is uh, now, one of the things that have been requested and we will have is some description of what these calculations correspond to. Uh, but for now, an easy way to wade through these different calculations is have your instru instrument setup tab uh, selected so that you can now step through this and see what these different calculations correspond to, which filter. Now, I'm not interested in any of the medium band filters, let's say. So I'm just going to uh, uncheck those. And I'm only going to leave the ones with the white band, if that's what I'm interested to compare. Um, let's uncheck that. Let's uncheck that. Um, and then all of these are the white band filters, so I'm just going to leave them there. And that should help me uh, compare all the white band filters. Now, one thing I want to remind you when you make a comparison like this, um, Sometimes you might see unexpected results. And the one such, uh, when, what you should pay attention to is things like strategy, for example. Now, in this case, you're doing a calculation for filters going all the way from uh, you know, 1 micron all the way to uh, 4.5 or 5 microns. Now, you know that the PSF changes as a function of wavelength. So in your strategy, if you have set uh, an aperture radius that is not appropriate for a wider PSF, then you know, you can see that the background sky annulus is at 0.2, and you may end up subtracting a significant part of the profile of your PSF uh, from the source itself, as a result of which you may see weird results. So when you see something like that, you have to pay attention to the strategy. So if you're running the batch mode, you probably want to make sure that the aperture radius that you set right at the beginning is suitable for all of those calculations. So that was the batch expansion. Um, so let's see what else do I have. Um, okay. So, so that was a demo about the batch expansions. Now we want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we only have a little time left, so I'm probably just going to show you one more thing. Let me create a new source here. And what I want to show you is about the errors and the warnings. So I'm going to make this a really bright target. And 
continue and let me say uh, actually going to leave it at a uh, flat continuum but I'm going to normalize it in a band pass uh, let me make this something really bright let's say I use 10 milligrams key probably that should be so let me make it 10 really dense in the Miri filter. Uh, so for this purpose, I'm just going to leave it there. And because I don't, you know that I've already run a whole lot of batch calculations in the previous, uh, in the on the calculation page. So I don't want to touch that scene because it's just going to uh, recalculate all of that. So instead, what I will do is I will make a new scene. And I'm going to add the bright target on that scene. And now I'm going to go to my calculations page, and I just want to do a very imaging cap. Oh, hold on, very imaging calculation. And what I'm going to do here is choose my bright target. So that's the second scene. So you have the bright target there, and I'm just going to do a copy. So you can see I have warnings now, and the status in the calculation table already tells me there's a warning. I go into the warnings tab, and it tells me there are 29, par there's partial saturation, 29 saturated pixels at the end of a ramp, and those ramps may still be used in some cases. And there is full saturation on one pixel. <clears throat> so that's the 2D SNR plot. There's your detector. And when you go to the saturation map, it shows you the one saturated pixel in red. And all of the partial saturation can be seen uh, highlighted here. So, so this is how uh, you know your warnings are useful. And your saturation map can be used to go and check the saturation. Um, so that is pretty much all I had for demo. Now, there's one thing I want to show you, just how you can create very complex scenes for that. I don't have the time to go into it uh, by actually creating it one by one, by adding the you know, complexities to the source. Instead, I'm just going to load an existing workbook where I have already created a complicated, a complex source, in this case, it is a source that where you have a host galaxy with a spectral template that is chosen from the brown atlas. And then I have added to that an AGN, which is a power law continuum, and it's just a point source. Uh, and then you can actually add a jet or an outflow. And the way I have implemented that is by choosing a flat continuum, but then I made the continuum really, really faint, and then I added lines to that. And what I have added here now, if you go to the continuum, it's actually a redshift two source. So what I have put in here is an H alpha line. So the way you do that is you just go there, uh, you edit the name of the line, whatever you want to call it, and then provide the line center, and then you can give the line width and the line strength. And once you have specified those parameters, uh, you go here and you add, and once you add the line, they will appear here under your line list. And then you can, you know, it do doesn't just have to be one emission line. You can just add as many lines as you want. You can update and also remove the lines once you select them. If you want to remove, you can remove or update. Or if you want to add lines, you can, you know, add a new uh, line to it. Uh, so. And then I put them all in the scene, and that's what it looks like. So as you highlight it, you can see when you when you click on the host galaxy, you can see that the host galaxy is highlighted in the scene sketch. And then you have the AGN, and then you have the jet or the outflow. And also down here, it shows you the spectrum for, let's see if it's, okay. So as you step through the different sources, you can see the different spectrum that I have used for the sources. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to the calculations, and I want to show you some of the calculations that I did for the source. Uh, I basically wanted to use this to illustrate slitless spectroscopy. 
So there is the nearest imaging in the 200 uh, F two hundred W filter. So if you remember, the, uh, the redshift at H alpha for that particular redshift was in the F200 filter. So you can actually see that is that shows up in your image in the 200 filter and in the other filters in 150 and so on, you're only sampling the <coughs> continuum from the source. And interestingly, uh, so there is the emission line in your wide field slitless uh, mode of nearest. So you can actually see the emission line uh, and the way the slitless spectra works in nearest is your you use the filters in combination with the grism so that you get different segments of uh, wavelength coverage. And this is the wavelength uh, coverage that you get in F200, and you can see your emission line. Now you can use whatever strategy you want to extract, uh, you know, what the flux of the emission line is, what is the signal to noise of the emission line. So, so that is all I have for the demo. And I'm going to close the session here. Do you want to take questions from anyone? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm just going to put up this slide here. And here is what you can do with, uh, so this is a combination of the three images that I showed you earlier, where the red is the F200 filter. So you can actually see that little bit of uh, emission there on the left. That's the combined image of the, uh, in the F200, 150, and uh, F90 filter. And what you see below are the GRISM observations using NERES, um, using the GR150R GRISM in combination with three different filters. Uh, the F115 is the blue, F150 is the green, and then you have the red, which is F200, and that shows you the H alpha emission. So this just shows you how versatile the ETC is and how you can actually, you know, uh, do a very realistic uh, two-dimensional analysis to get your signal to noise ratio. Uh, that's it, and thanks for your attention. I'll take questions. Does anyone in the room have any questions for Sparrow? Okay, if not, how about on either WebEx or um, uh, BlueJeans? Um, I, I think on BlueJeans, there's a question and answer box where you can type in a question um, and Sparrow will be able to see it. Oh, I hear somebody say, uh, Nora, did you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have that, but we have got that request uh, repeatedly, and uh, <laughs> so and that, that is something that we will consider. Unfortunately, we don't have that right now. For now, I think the workaround is for now the workaround is to be careful about not, uh, you know, modifying your default scene too much, and you know, make it very complicated, which will slow down the calculation. Scott has a question. Yes, I had a question. In the report section, I saw two times. There was an observation time, I think, and an exposure time or something like I don't remember now exactly what they were. And on your examples, they were always the same. I have one yes. where they're different. So, so they will be different, for example, in an IFU calculation yes, where you have a not, not in and a, you know, a, a not off scene. So in that case, you will find a different observation setup. I see. Because in okay. that case, ETC will, um, you know, do both. I mean, it'll do an in-scene and off-scene, and then uh, because the strategy involves subtracting the background by using the not yes not position. Right. And how so will the, this compare with the time that I see in APT, for example? Uh, so APT will include the overheads. Uh, and, okay. And, and are these just is, the photon collection times that mm -hmm. I'm seeing here? Yes. I see. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions from anybody? Um, if not, uh, thank you again, Swara, for giving this demo today. Um, uh, this uh, presentation will be posted on the web um, within a couple days. And just as a reminder, there is also a JVST ETC presentation, um, more like a high-level architecture presentation and algorithm presentation by Klaus Klon Tapidon, which was given in January, which is also archived um, on the web. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.